I hate how there's fingerprints all over everything. Hey, guy. <laughs> What's their fingerprints on? There's just like dirty, like my, from my hands being dirty, like mounting all this stuff. It's just all over everything. And I don't know how to get that off like raw fiberglass. You ever wipe anything down or? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Try to bio wash. It doesn't take it off. Try to bio wash it? Yeah. Maximum bio wash. What is that? Like their spray cleaner. To I use that on everything. Off? Huh? To get fingerprints off? <laughs> Clearly not. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we're gonna to be doing another update video on the Ranger build. It's been quite a while since the last one of these videos and Christian's been making a lot of progress as you can see. Um, we were talking about it, probably gonna start at the front today and work through the back of the vehicle. So where do you where do you wanna start exactly? I mean, the lights are here, so we might as well just talk about them. This okay. is the most recent thing. Uh, we weren't planning on doing lights on this like go around, on the first go around of this truck, but we had a little bit of time because Jake was coming down, uh, so Ryan decided he wanted to get some lights for the front of the truck and just get it done while the truck was here and it's everything still raw. So we did five XL80s on the front of this thing. There's the ambers on the outsides, which will be on their own switch. And then the three lights on the inside, just the clears, uh, it's at their combos. So they have spot and flood built into them. And then the center one is actually a racer edition. Okay. So it's not like the standard XL80. This is, it's actually a lower lumen output, but this throws light further. So it's just, according to Ryan and everybody that knows Baja Designs, there's different like light ranges that you can get and stages that you can get. So Ryan's pumped that he has all five stages or whatever it is. Okay, that's quite the concept. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know what the theories are behind that. I just know that these lights put out a lot of light because they're the same lights that I had on my old truck. Sure. So, so there's kind of two things there that you touched on. One is like the lumen rating, mm -hmm. which is how much light you can put out. And yes. then also, the pattern um, that the light puts out. So you have the flood and then what's the other one? Is it the spot? This would just be like uh, driving, like a spot, yeah. Okay, and then, so you have a bunch of different options. You also can go either pods like this mm -hmm. or you can run a bar setup. What made Ryan or you want to, to pivot towards running this? Uh, the reason he wanted to run these is because of my previous truck, like he saw the light output that that truck had and he, he didn't think he needed any more light than what that truck was putting out. So uh, my old truck had six of these lights on the front of it but with the way that everything fit within the grill profile, the five looked the best. Four would have been too little, but five is the most optimum way to, to get everything spaced out. So we went with five on this one. Um, and yeah, so it's on, it's on a removable bar that mounts to the, the top of the bumper. So in the previous video, we were talking about how I built this section. This, the main bumper tube sticks out past um, like where the face of the, like the header panel and all that stuff is. And normally I, I, do, I do not do that. Like all the bumpers that I've normally done, they're pretty tucked to the front of the truck. Sure. But this one I popped out because I knew we were gonna be putting lights on the front of this at some point. I didn't know if it was gonna be now or later, if you just brought the truck back and we did lights later. Uh, but this, now you can see kind of like the idea behind the concept. So the, the, the lights sit on a one inch tube structure that is bolted to the front of the bumper. You can, can you see that? Yep. So there's, there's a tube boss that goes through the main two inch bumper tube and it goes all the way to the bottom. So you can see, you can get down inside of there and the nuts on the inside right there. Okay. And then the one inch bar just mounts to the top of that. And it's just standoffs that come off of that. And then a radius, if you, if you get a side profile of it, we talked about the main bumper tube having a radius to it. And then this one inch tube also has a radius to it now as well. And it has a little bit more radius to it because this center light uh, is, it gets tight. So the center of this one inch tube needed to be out just a little bit further. So the, the radiuses are a little bit different between the two tubes, but honestly, like you're never going to notice that kind of stuff unless I tell you that. <laughs> sure. Sure. It's just those fine details that yeah. make it into the finished product. And then if so, you, sorry, on this setup, do mm -hmm. you say that there's a threaded, um, like, is there, it's a not threaded. It's just a normal or? nut. Okay, no, so it's just a normal nut. nut. So okay. you put, you just put a socket through the bottom, socket on the top, and then you just pop it out. It's just a three eighths bolt that holds it on both sides. And we may end up, we probably will end up putting safety hardware in here okay. for the main bar itself. And then every light will have safety hardware on it too, just That's as just a safety precaution. Like a theft type thing. Yeah, because if he's driving this thing on the street, he, he, the reason it's removable is so he can pull it off when he's driving the truck on the street. But I know with like my last truck, I had the same option. I did it a couple times. And then after a desert trip, I'm like, dude, like I don't want to pull these things off. Yeah. And I just leave the, the lights on the truck yeah, because it, it looks cool for one. And it just kind of fits, like it makes it, it finishes out the truck it having does. the lights on the front because now that you see it with lights when you pull them off it's like <laughs> this looks funky like this sure. doesn't look right sure so they'll probably end up staying on there so we'll do the safety hardware for everything 
Uh, and then Ryan also did, he started on the wiring for all this stuff. So all the lights kind of come together and then they all go down right here through a hole in that, this top plate. You can kind of see that down in there. A little access. Um, and then there's a, a nice connector down there that everything goes to. So he's been working on the wiring, uh, just getting all the accessories wired up. Uh, the, you'll see once we pull the hood off, he's been working on the factory engine harness as well. Uh, it's kind of a mess in there right now because we're deleting things and just try, trying to figure out where everything's going to go. But uh, he's been working on all the wiring. And he's, so that's he, something that we've touched on mm -hmm. a little bit is Ryan, the owner of this truck, um, who a lot of you should probably know from watching these videos, he's wiring this whole truck. That's a challenge that he took upon himself and yes. something that he wanted to pursue, which is which is awesome yeah. um, to see people wanting to learn things and, and go that route. So he's been working hard on this truck, been learning a lot and been doing it all. Um, he's building the harness at home. Yep. And then coming over here and putting it on the truck and, and trying things out. But talking to him today, he's got the front wrapped up, um, pretty much the rears wrapped up. And then it's the um, cab of the truck that needs a lot of the work, which we'll get to. There's a lot of progress that yeah. he's made there as well. Um, but very cool that he's he's going for it and, mm -hmm. and wanting to do that. Yeah, he's taking, he's doing all the online courses, paid for the online courses, went through all that, got all the correct tools to be doing the wiring the right way. So he's he's doing it the proper way too. It's not like he's just butt connecting things together. Yep. So. Yep. <laughs> It's gonna come out really nice. Cool. Um, so lights are on the front now. That's ready to go. Uh, what I was gonna touch on, <laughs> just because you know, stay on brand. <laughs> you look at all the tabs. Oh yeah. Under the light, there's three holes on every tab because you know. I don't even know if I'm gonna be able to get that. Got to show out, out, dude. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's just I. I had to make to heart. <laughs> I had to make the tabs, so it's like I. The tab ended up being pretty big because these lights, the depth of the light is pretty gnarly, and where they actually mount to, the tabs ended up being pretty like long in distance, like front to back. So I figured might as well, might as well break it up and put some, some design into it. Um, so yeah, lights are on the front, uh, limit straps are on. So we can kind of just look at that real quick. Um, I ended up just making tabs for the frame side and on the, the radius arm. Okay, so those are two pieces of 3 16 for the main tab welded together on the edge, blended out, and then there's eighth inch overlays on each side. So what that's allowing everything to do is when you have two straps like that it makes the straps like not be bound up where the where the actual like nylon strap is at it holds everything at the correct width on the the strap there on the tab side so you're saying the two metal tabs are spaced apart enough exactly the perfect fine. amount so when everything droops out like nothing's in like weird tension or compression or anything like that like everything is just slacked out exactly the width that it needs to be um so it's like that top and bottom and then also on the rear as well which we'll get to in a little while but um those are on the front now. The front of this thing is strapped at 21 inches of travel. So I don't think we've ever touched on that Which in is... any other video because I never really measured it. Because honestly, when you get to a truck that's at this extent, wheel travel is just kind of like a, it's like a measuring contest if you want to go there. I mean, there, it's important too. Like you... It is, but it isn't. The only thing I'm honestly worried about is up travel from ride height. That's the only thing I care about. The droop travel, which is where your overall travel number comes from, I could care less about because I know all these trucks are going to be over 18 inches of wheel travel. And when you do that, when you're over that amount of travel, if you're talking between 20 to 24 inches of wheel travel, it's all the same at the end of the day. Like yeah, it's, there, there's there, no, there's definitely a limit. So like you want your, you want enough wheel travel to where you always keep the tire on the ground and whoop sections as much as possible. But yes, and it no. gets to a point where you're hitting the whoops at such high speed that there's not enough rebound force and the tires not coming out quick enough to use all that travel. So you, you, you want to get enough wheel travel where exactly that the sweet spot is, is tough to say, the but faster with you 21, start going, the faster you start going, the less your tires are touching the ground. Yep. Exactly. So, so 21 is, is healthy. That's mm -hmm. a lot. Um, yeah. And especially truck. like to keep in mind too, this is a, a 82 inch track width on the front of this truck. So it's very narrow in comparison to a lot of trucks. Uh, the compare, like the front of our truck is, what is it? 91. Yeah, it should be 91. Yeah, right around 91, which is full size track width. Normally on Ford Rangers, you're anywhere between the 86 to 89 inch track width range. This is 82, so it's definitely narrow. And the reason, just to like touch on that again, the reason why this truck is so narrow is because of uh, what ended up happening with this truck. So we set the rear end, the rear axle housing. When we purchased that, that was one of the first things that we bought. We set that up around this truck, still using the camber kit that it had previously. So that was the original intention was this thing was going to keep the camber kit on it. We were going to put a bypass on the front of this thing and just run it as is. But once we built the rear end, we realized like we, we kind of need to do a front end on this thing. So the rear end set the width limitation for the front. So the rear is actually narrower than what the front is. So I pushed the track width on the front of this truck out as much as I could without it looking absolutely goofy. 
and that ended up being at 82 inch track width. So the rear is actually 70, what is it at? 76, 76 inches outside tire to outside tire, which is crazy narrow when you think about it, but it actually doesn't look too out of place on this truck being a single cab Ranger. So it all kind of works out in its own way. Um, the, the track width and the wheelbase are definitely small in comparison to a lot of other vehicles. Yeah, it's not just the track, like the, the truck as a whole is It is, yeah. Down. Yeah, because it's a 110 inch wheelbase, which is quite small. <laughs> and then it's 82 inch track in the front, 76 inch track in the rear. This thing's gonna be really fun and like cornering maneuvers. Yes, it'll be very, this how... truck will be very nimble at high speed through whoops and stuff like that. It will do okay, but you're definitely gonna have that fine line of where you're just, you gotta know how to drive this. Cool. So we, we covered lights, we covered the limit straps. Mm -hmm. um, also, you got something going on on the hood now. You wanna walk oh, yeah. through what that is? Yeah, so we got, I think we talked about this in previous videos as well. So all the air that is getting rammed through, through the radiator, we had all that panel work in here. That's basically making sure all that air is going through the radiator and not escaping up into the top of the hood. So all that air getting, getting rammed into the radiator and then all that hot air expelling out of the fans, out of the back of the radiator needs to go somewhere. Uh, and then normally on most trucks, it'll just vent out the sides of the fenders, like just through the wheel openings. But these 4.0 V6 trucks uh, are pretty known for having overheating problems. So to kind of prevent that, we have all that hot air coming in through the radiator to cool everything. And then all that hot air is getting thrown at the motor. And then now it's being able to escape out the top of the hood. So this, if you, you, you can, you kind of, you can kind of see what it's doing from that side. But if you look from the back side, you can really see what's going on there. Um, and it's just allowing all that hot air to get out of the hood and then not just sit there and heat soak the engine. Yeah. yeah Cause like the, the hot air is all coming up. So you have to have hot an evacuation. Rises, yes. You have to have an evacuation pathway, which like maybe you'll get some through the cracks here, but having like a dedicated mm -hmm. vent for that is just going to relieve all the Well, and it's right. It's dead through. center of where everything is flowing. So all that hot air is going through the two radiator fans and then it's just getting blown straight into the engine so if it has somewhere to escape immediately it just prevents the chances of things getting hot yep. as much as possible it'd be cool to run a study with just like a stock hood mm -hmm. and maybe put some sort of temperature sensor in there and see the difference and swap hoods later yeah and just like try and do a little experiment gotta hit up robert at autofab and see if we'll get another yeah, hood and yeah. we can test some theories cool um or just find some way to block that off but you could do that too it, it it's, it, that was one of the things that was definitely nerve wracking because these are not cheap hoods. Like these Autofab hoods, they're super nice quality. They got all the internal bracing on the inside. Uh, to like, just go for it and be like, okay, cool. Like we're committed to this on doing the hood vent was like one of those things. Like I had to measure like 13 times to make sure everything was right where it needs to be. Um, and it was definitely knows, like, like taking you, that first you, cut, if, I was like, Ugh. If you only did 12 measurements, it, like it could have gone wrong. Could have. So. That's why I did 13, pal. <laughs> so cool. that, that came out good. And then you could also see two sensor right here. Uh, I did a fill panel. So this spot on these trucks factory has the windshield wiper, like where the windshield wipers come out, like their little posts. And then it also has uh, the windshield wiper fluid little uh, clips that sit on here. And then there's also just a bunch of venting that sits up in here as well. Uh, so because we cut the whole firewall out of the truck, uh, this was just, this would have just been open and it would allow water and stuff to go through all that, those venting holes, uh, and just basically land on top of the engine, which this is still doing the same thing, but having this just be capped off, it just cleaned everything up because we are not running windshield wipers on this truck, uh, just that, because of the clearance that, issues okay. on the underside of where all this stuff is at. There's no way to run the factory stuff for sure. Uh, and all the hot rod kind of styled windshield wipers that you can get like aftermarket market stuff is just not that great. So we haven't found something that we're like super stoked on, so which is why this ended up just getting just closed off for now. If we find something that works later that we like, that will work with this application, that'll fit up in there the way that it needs to. Basically, we just need a motor on wiper. So each wiper will need its own motor sure. on the actual assembly instead of having a linkage connect the two because the linkage will just hit the engine cage and it'll hit a bunch of stuff inside of there. So. Uh, the tight, the space gets just really tight up underneath there and there's just no good alternative, uh, for these trucks. So for now it's just, just covered up and then he'll run, uh, like the rain X on the windshield. So it'll just deflect the water off as much as possible and he'll be, he'll be fine. Cool. Um, anything else on the front before we, yeah, jump let's inside? pop the hood. There's a couple, couple things mounted up in here. We could, 
You could look at the wiring too. Um, okay, so is it actually on the truck currently? The Not any of his, like the fresh wiring that he's doing, but the, the engine management stuff. You don't need to do that, I got it. All the engine management, like factory engine harness stuff is in there. And then the computer's mounted, which I don't think we've talked about. Okay. So you can see there's a lot. A <laughs> little, bit, little bit of a bird's nest, but nothing's yes. nothing's so, really bad yet. With all this wiring, we'll just touch on this real quick because this is all Ryan's. This is Ryan's baby right here. Um, all the, the factory harness is all de-loomed. So all the like electrical tape is taken off the wiring. All the, the like weather looming is taking off it as, as well. Just because he's in here deleting wires that are not needed for running this engine at this point. So he, everything that is connected to the computer to the engine now is strictly only to power the engine and it's no other functions. Okay. So he's, he's in the process of getting all those wires cut out that he doesn't need and then uh, hooking up stuff that he does need into the factory harness for just different things. Um, but that is like probably the least amount of time that he spent on anything as far as wiring goes. He just kind of de-loomed it. We got it set in there kind of roughly where it's gonna go. And then once this is all like loom back up, it'll look all proper and nice again. But we just basically needed it to go in there because I've been like adding grounds. I don't know if you can see that, but there's I've been mounting grounds all over the place. There's one up here. It's just, it's just bolts, just studs that I'm putting on the chassis. There's some on the frame on both sides for the starter, for all a bunch of different things. Um, so we've been, we've been messing around with that and just getting all the wiring, trying to figure out like just sort through the wiring, all the accessory stuff like for the headlights, there's horns in here now. Um, these front lights, the fans for the radiator, all that kind of stuff that we're adding to the truck is very easy to wire to because you're just running all fresh stuff. When it comes to that kind of stuff with factory engine management, it gets a little bit more tricky because there's stuff that's getting cut out that needs to be, like there's loose ends that need to be reconnected and just different, all sorts of different kinds of stuff that comes along with that. So that will be something that he will get to. Um, since we're on the topic too with wiring stuff, the, if you go in through the wheel opening, you can see where the computer's at mounted up on the firewall now too. So I just built a box for the computer and then that just keeps it sealed off from the elements. And then that has rubber isolators that isolate it from like the firewall. And what that's doing is just any of the vibration and stuff like that that's coming throughout the truck, those isolators are just kind of keeping that to a minimum for the computer itself. And then there's also, if you look up in here, uh, there's modules that are mounted to this tube structure right here. Um, again, on brand, got to keep it three holes. <laughs> so Going to different sizes too now, so you're kind of... Yeah, just, you know, just trying to throw them in where I can. the style a little bit. Yeah. Getting yeah. a little broader. Cool. So that's up in there. Uh, we also did a different power steering pump on this. So... This is also <laughs> the mount for this. Yeah. Way nicer than the actual thing you're mounting too. Yeah, of course. <laughs> that's awesome. Which that, like, that's... So that overflow for the coolant setup, <laughs> that is what he, that's his old one actually. I'm just using that for mock-up. We have a brand new one, but that like setup right there is what he had on his old, like the old setup for this truck. And he wanted to run the same thing again. Just so instead of, instead of spending the 350 bucks or whatever it is on like the crazy CBR one with the, the cap and stuff on it, he's just, we're just gonna run that uh, just cause it's simple to do. And yeah. it worked before, perfect. So it's like, why change something that sure. was already working? It, no, it completely works. It's just funny that it's like a very inexpensive yeah. reservoir, and then you just have a really, really just nice gangster mount for it. dual yeah. pass TIG welded, like <laughs> just crazy mount. Watch the. That's funny. Uh, but yeah, so we did power, a new power steering pump on this thing. So the factory power steering pumps on these trucks, uh, when you go to bigger tires, and this kind of steering system, it just puts a lot of stress on the on the power steering pump. So this is a higher flow pump. This is a Saganob pump that's on this and then I had to come in we had to modify the bracket and then I made an adapter that gets this pump mounted to the factory bracket and then it keeps the pulleys and everything in line okay and what is this pump from a newer ranger or something else? no it's from a I believe it's like a 06 jeep okay something like that but it's just a like a standard this is like a common thing like if you look up the 4.0 rangers okay. and you look up at like a power steering pump upgrade this is a very common like pump that you put on these trucks, but you do have to do some modifications to get them to fit on everything going on here. Okay, and what is changed on the pump? Like is the flow rate higher? Is flow the rate is higher. Pressure higher as well? Yep, yep. So okay. this this takes out the wine, like the, like the standard Ford wine, and then it also bumps the pressure up for everything too. So he, when the, his box, he has that redhead steering box in there, mm -hmm. and that thing's set up for ram assist. It already has the ports welded to the box. 
they're just going to be capped off for now. He's not running Ram Assist on this thing. Um, when he does decide to go to Ram Assist, we'll have to go to a full different power steering system anyways, as far as the pump goes. Yeah. So this is just kind of like a happy medium. Like he's getting more benefits out of it. It should last longer. It's going to be better with these size tire and the steering setup. So this was like the kind of cheaper alternative that should get him by for the time being. And then if this still ends up not working good for this truck, then we'll put like a nice Howl pump in it and then get all the Ram Assist set up for this thing. Cool. And so, yeah, it'll be curious to see how well it does, yeah. um, especially with the steering that has a slightly quicker ratio than stock mm -hmm. for sure. Um, also the bigger tires Yes. Um, and different scrub and whatever have you. So mm -hmm. cool to see what this will do. Um, you said it was a common thing, but you ought to make a custom bracket. Yeah, so is, you can. Is there like, solutions out there available? It's, or? it's one of those things like you can buy the adapter brackets, okay. but it was like, I might as well do it because if anybody needs it now, like if people want the, to put this power steering pump on their Ranger, I have the brackets sure. and I can sell them and you can just buy them. You know what I mean? So it's one of those things like we were already planning on doing it. I didn't know. Another thing too is like, I didn't know if this pump had to go in a specific location because of how tight everything is and with the steering box coming up, I didn't want to just get some generic off the shelf mount uh that was already made and then like spend the money on it and then get it and be like oh crap like i gotta make it anyways so yep. it's like one of those things i might as well just make it and now i have it available so if there's any other rangers down the road that i'm working on uh that need it then we i can just and want to go to this pump upgrade i can just cut the brackets out real quick tap them and then here we go cool um i also see you have the jamar reservoir is that for just the the brake fluid or is this that is, also for the this is for brakes so you could see if you look on this side there's front it's it's labeled front brake and rear brake so each one is its own individual system so you need to have their own individual master or, uh, reservoirs to go along with that and then this guy right here is for the clutch so okay. we didn't we were originally talking about doing jamar makes a a three three bay if you want to call it that a three bay like uh, reservoir setup that has just three of these in line but knowing that when he goes to a v8 in this truck it's not going to have a clutch pedal anymore this is just kind of no, I don't want to say temporary because I don't know how long this engine is going to be in this truck. It could be forever. It could be a season. I have no idea. But because down the road, when he goes to a V8, this truck will not have a clutch pedal. It doesn't make sense to have the nice, really expensive uh, reservoir setup and then have the third one here and not be using it. So save a little bit of money on that. Just get like a nice little Amazon special for the, the clutch reservoir because all it is is just a container. That's all it needs to be. Cool. Um, and that's what we're running for his, his clutch setup as well. And I'm also seeing you added another um, kind of support for the fender yes. as well in here. Yeah, so this this guy right here, what this is doing. Only a single hole on this one though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Weight savings, dude. <laughs> it's a big hole though. Yeah. So this what this is doing is when I got, you in the last video, the hood and fenders were mounted on the truck but I went through and cleaned up all the body lines on everything and just get got all the body lines like set and equal as best I could because when you start going to different companies glass, like this is all ADV front glass and that's an autofab hood. When you start mixing and matching like that, not everything is gonna be made exactly the same to fit within themselves. So I had to pull, what these are doing is they're pulling the lip of this fender up, like this whole edge up to match where the line of the hood is. Okay. And then I gapped the hood like perfect to the fenders and then same thing on the back side here. We can throw it on too if we want to look at it, but all the gapping is proper now to everything. No, go on this <laughs> side, go around me, because this, right. is, this is like the money shot right here. Okay. Can you look from this side? In the last video, we walked through the pedal setup and the steering column. Since then, you've put together a completely custom dash for the truck and center console. Yes. Um, where did you even begin on that? What was the, the process for that like? This was, that was probably the biggest hurdle that I had to, to do with this whole thing was like where I knew what I wanted, but the just never doing this before, I didn't even know where to start with it, to be honest, because now that it's complete, you're like, oh, cool. There's this, that, this, that, like it all looks like it's, it's meant to go where it's meant to go. But when you have nothing here and you're like, okay, what is literally, what is the very first piece to start on this thing? That took, that like racked my brain for a minute. <laughs> so I started with like the center section. Basically this, this front face, this face down here where the, the radio and the switch pros mounted to, that panel coming from where the trans tunnel is coming up and then this front face for where there's an iPad that sits here. So where all that stuff sits at, that, that face is what I started with and then just basically tied everything into the windshield line. So I started in the center and then just worked my way left and right uh, to, to just finish the dash out. But okay. the so structure- You, you had ahead. kind of a list of things that you knew needed to go in the dash. Yeah, I knew what needed an iPad here. Mm -hmm. 
um, and then you kind of worked from center outwards. That yes. was your, your strategy there. Yeah, and that, that was just, that was the easiest way for me to think about it because when there's nothing here, I don't know where this, like if I was gonna start on this side, I don't know where this stops, right? Like I don't know where this, this portion of the dash is gonna stop at. So I can't just make this and stop it here and be like, okay, cool, that's where the center's gonna go. Like the center to me makes the most sense. I don't know how other people are building these things, but for me working from the very middle of the truck and then working outwards was the easiest way to do it. Uh, and then I knew, like, you're, like you touched on, I knew all the accessories that were going to be mounted inside of here. Like he already had all the gauges. We knew the iPad was gonna be like the main center piece of the dash. We had all his radio set up that he got from PCI that he won on a giveaway, which is pretty cool. And then he had everything else that's in the console, which we'll talk about. But just starting with the center, knowing that the iPad was going there, like dead center in the middle of the truck because he wants to be able to reach it. And then he also wants the, the passenger to be able to reach it too if, if they wanna be able to change a song on his iPad or whatever whatever they're, they're trying to do, watch a movie. <laughs> yeah. They could literally do whatever. Play um, some games real quick. Yeah, so I knew, I knew the shape of the iPad, which I don't, I think Ryan took it. I had, I basically made an, a mock-up like an aluminum mock-up of what the shape of an iPad is, like the exact dimensions of his iPad. And then I used that to basically set the, the width for all this stuff uh, to get the iPad to sit in here exactly how it needs to. And this big circle here is for a magnet. So he uses, it's using a mob armor uh, magnet mount to hold the iPad into the dash. So he can pull the iPad, iPad out when he gets to the desert. If he's just chilling at camp, he can pull it out and play games on his, on his iPad or do whatever he wants to do. Um, but that's that was the starting point and then just coming up with general ideas on shape uh, I knew I didn't want to have like real fine pointed edges on stuff So I ended up putting a border on everything like a nice three-quarter inch border that that goes all the way around where the iPad is And then that follows into the little lip for where the gauges are as well Here I'm just gonna remove this guy so we get better yeah. visibility um, yeah, so in terms of material, um, how'd you decide what you're gonna use? And um, obviously you've welded it together, but mm -hmm. you're also using silicon bronze. Um, what was your thought process on the material selection? Material, I just matched like what the floor is made out of. Okay. So this is all 16 gauge steel. Uh, and the reason I went with steel instead of like an aluminum, I knew I wanted to weld this dash into the truck. And also just creating 3D shapes like this, it's a lot easier to do this stuff out of steel weld it real quick and then be able to blend it out where aluminum is a lot more difficult when it's when you start to blend stuff out you really have to be careful of making sure you're welding stuff on the back side too and not just the front side but the back side as well where steel you can get away with just welding just the outside of a shape it's going to penetrate way better and grab it real the, both materials really well and then you can just sand that off and it's going to be totally fine forever as long as you're getting good penetration and you know how to weld <laughs> so this I, that's the reason why I went with steel. Um, yeah, like I don't, there cool. wasn't really like, it, yeah, that, it, that was it really, be as simple as that. Yeah, that was, <laughs> that was literally it. So steel, because I could, I could weld and blend things. So like this whole, this whole edge, for example, is all one piece. And then it's welded on this, this flange and this flange, all that stuff is all welded and blended out. And then the inside perimeter is all uh, silicon bronzed and then everywhere where there's like a main junction where things come together, like certain pieces come together, that's all silicon bronzed as well. And that's just because I don't, like these kind of welds everywhere there is silicon bronze, those are welds that are not gonna be like sanded and blended away. And I, when you put that much heat, if you're actually doing like normal filler material, like steel filler in there, it's gonna start warping and turning all these, all these like really uh, thin pieces of metal into like bananas. So it's just, it's, it's the silicon bronze is just there to keep the heat out of the parts yep. uh, I'd, as you're I'd, welding it. I'd say that's something that we learned too. Um, if some people remember the door panels that we built for the, <laughs> the bug, those things by the end, they're, they're aluminum, really warped and, and beat up by the end, which- yep, That's a learning curve. Yep, exactly. So kind of lessons learned yeah. on that, um, that it were applied to this and resulted in a much better product. Mm -hmm. um, cool, so you worked your way out. Um, you have press brake here, dives down, and then yes. the top you have almost a crown. Um, to allow space for all the gauges. Um, moving to that, you obviously have traditional style gauges um, rather gauges, than yeah. just like a electronic cluster. Yes. Um, why'd you go that route? Just because this truck is still running factory engine management. So if, if this thing got like a Holly, like a V8 and a Holly setup, it probably from the get-go would have gotten a digital display in it. But because this truck is still running off all the mechanical stuff on the engine management side, 
um, it just made sense. And I think too, just being period correct for this truck, like having the, the mechanical style gauges in there, like it just visually looks a lot cooler. So, okay. so that, are these a true like mechanical gauge or yes. are they? Okay, awesome. And then what are, are these lights? Yes, that's for the turning lights? signals. Oh, turning signals, okay. Mm -hmm. So he found those. There's also gonna be another one on there as well we were talking about doing. Those two are gonna be green, like the, they're green color. So you could see which way your turn signals are on because that's another thing with that, with that column. When I put the, the spline section for the quick disconnect on there, the, there's like a lockout mechanism for the turn signal. And when, when, the truck, when you turn the steering wheel and it comes back to center, it would turn the, the blinkers off. Like turn the, it would knock the lever down yep. to just go back to not having your turn signals on. When you put that spline section on, that mechanical like plastic piece inside of the column got so close to where I was welding to, I, it, would, it would have just melted it completely out of the column. So I just ended up pulling it off before I put everything on. So now he just needs to be mindful of like when he turns a call, like turns a turn signal on, he has to manually turn it back off. So that's okay. why having indications on there, like he'll be able to visually see like, oh crap, like my turn signal's on. Sure. And he can turn it off. Uh, yeah. And like, do these make any noise? Like a click no, noise? No, I don't think um, so. And with the noise level of the truck and you're wearing headsets, you're never going to hear it. You're so never going to, yeah. You'll never even. definitely yeah. answer there. And there will be another light too, a red light that'll be on there and that's going to be coming off the alternator. So if he loses charging, okay. like that light will come on and then you'll know. Um, but yeah, based on that side, that's pretty much it. You can kind of see everything going on for the plumbing with the master cylinders. So all three master cylinders are in there now. There is this, the one with the soft line on it that's coming from the uh, clutch pedal. And that's just for ease because that's the only four inch or dash four uh, line on there. Everything else is dash three, three for the brake system. So doing a soft line for that just gets it routed where it needs to go a little bit easier. Uh, and then you can kind of see on the brake side, there's a lot of stuff going on actually for the brake plumbing. So you can see the hard lines coming out of here. Then it goes to a brake pressure switch. Yep. So that is what's going to trigger his taillights. And then they go back, drop down. You can see where the pressure residual valves are, which these are the first times the first time that I'm running these on a truck. And what those are doing is just keeping pressure built up in the brake system. So on our truck, we have a problem where if you're going at a high rate of speed through whoops and the tires are dancing all around, there's deflection and all that stuff. And the hubs start to move a little bit. And when that happens, the rotor goes over and kisses the pads and it pushes the pads away from the rotor. And when you do, when that happens and you go to push the brake pedal when you need it, your brake just goes to the floor because it's, it's trying to suck those pads back to the rotor before they actually make contact to start braking the truck. Yep. Whereas that, having those in line, you can get them in different uh, pressure ratings. These are a four pound pressure rating. So they're on the lower side. You can get four, uh, eight, and then 10, I believe, is it the three different ratings that you can get. So we went with the lower side just to see what, what ends up happening. And then if he needs to bump up, it's not that big of a deal just to pop those things out. Yeah. So but, this is like, that's a common thing in road racing as well. Mm -hmm. And obviously like when you're moving fast and you need the brakes, you don't want the pedal dropping. You floor. do not know. So this keeps pressure in the system so that the pads don't float. Yes. Okay. So when, when the rotor comes over and kisses the pads, there's resistance on the other side of the pad and the fluid side that's keeping the pad in place instead of like pushing back into the system. Cool. Um, and then from there, where are we routing? So from there it goes, it comes around. So this right here is a parking brake. Okay. So how that works is you, you push your foot on the brake, you push this in, take your foot off the brake and this stays locked in. Okay. And this will, this, lock. yeah, it basically just locks out the system. And then when you want to release it, you just put your foot on the brake again real quick and it pops it back out. Okay. So this truck, obviously not having a factory parking brake anymore, and it is a manual having a, some sort of like brake system mounted parking brake is like very beneficial because if he parks on a hill, even if you put this thing in first gear, it still has, it could have a tendency to want to roll. So having like an actual hydraulically controlled parking brake is like pretty, pretty necessary for this thing. Cool. And then from there you dive it into the, the bottom of the floor yes. and then it goes out to the rest of the vehicle. Yep. So it just, it drops back behind the gas pedal and then it drops into the bulkheads down at the bottom of the floor. And then that goes to the front and rear brakes. Awesome. Um, Cool. In the, in the center console, I see you have switch pros, you have your head unit, mm -hmm. um, brake switch, or yeah, sorry, so he's, battery switch. Yeah, so he's going 12, 12 switch uh, switch pro, and then we have the Rockford Fosgate radio, and that's just for all his standard radio stuff. 
um, just like what we have in our truck. This is like a marine grade head unit, yep. um, which is very common in pre-runners. And then we do have the cutoff. So he, do, he is running two batteries on this truck, so he'll be able to utilize everything on this switch, which is nice. Um, and it's in a very nice spot as well, very easy to reach spot right in everybody's faces that's in the vehicle. So that way, if anything happens and he, you need to cut the power to this thing, or if Ryan ends up being knocked out and someone's in the passenger seat, they can turn the power off easily, um, which is something in our truck that we do not have. It's, yeah. it's not in a common spot, which is not very good. Yeah, but like I, I hate even having to talk about that, but like you yeah. got to plan for this is very important because if your truck's upside down and you're dumping fuel out of this thing and all the electronics are still on, all it takes is one spark and the truck is up in flames. So it's very critical. If something does happen, something bad happens, to be able to just cut the power to this truck, to everything in this truck, and then you don't have to worry about that as you're trying to get out of the truck, which you're already gonna be in a like frantic state at that point anyways. So you might as well not have to, the less stuff you have to worry about in that scenario, the better. Then you also have in the center your push to talks for the intercom setup. Yes. Um, as well as some, are those USBs for charging? Yeah, so I put the push to talks in a nice, easy convenient spot so when you're sitting in the truck you can just reach your hand on the console and push it which gives you like a nice point to like just grab onto and then these are just usbs so there's four usbs total now in the front of the truck or in the console and that is to be able to charge literally anything that you need so the ipad will have its own charging cord that will come out of the dash these will be for like if if ryan and a passenger have their phones that they need to be charging on the way to the desert or the way home from the desert or literally anything, they can just plug it in right here and they're ready to go. And then we have a access panel for all the electronics that are down inside of the console because that's where everything is at and then we'll, which we'll open that in a second. And then we also have the hookup for the headsets. So the headsets will hang right here off the hanger. And then when you go to throw them on, they'll plug in right here. So these are just basically plugs that go in there so nothing gets down into the ports for now. And then we also have big old cup holders in the back of this thing. Yeah, so will these fit like a traditional hydro flask as well? They should, yeah. So that, that's like a marine grade cup holder. They're way bigger in diameter, so they'll fit pretty much anything inside of them. And they're deep. That was the main thing for me, is I wanted the cup holders to be nice and deep. So when if there's a water bottle, for example, sitting in there, uh, when you're driving this thing through the desert, it's not going to want to like fly out of that that cup holder it'll just sit in there nice and tight and there's it'll just bounce back and forth inside of there instead of trying to fling itself out gotcha so that holds literally everything is down in here so this the switch pro modules in there the stuff for the ignition is in there there's a fuse box inside of here uh, you'll be able to get to the battery cut off all the wiring for that um, if something is happening with any of these you'll be able to get to those and then there's also uh, some factory stuff in there as well for the uh, starting system. Okay. So some of that stuff, it's going to be tucked up back inside of here a little bit more, but this is like the main hub for all the, the accessories and wiring for the truck. So everything will kind of have its brain position inside of the console. And the reason I added the, the plate on here is just for the ease of being able to get in there. Sure. Because if you had to pull the console off, which was the original idea, you just, if you need to get to something in there, you just pull the console out because it's, there's, three Zeus buttons on each side to hold it in, but to be able to get to those Zeus buttons, you gotta pull the seats out. Yep. And if you're in the desert you do, and you're having an electrical problem, the last thing you wanna do is have to pull the seats out to be able to get to the Zeus buttons, to be able to pull the dash apart. So just having a nice quick little access panel, be able to see down inside of there and see what's going on and, and kind of diagnose if there is if he is having a problem, um, he'll be able to do that very easily. And one thing that I noticed is that all of the access panels that you do, you recess the mount so that the panel itself is flush with the rest of the yes. system. So here you can see it's offset down and then that panel sits flush mm -hmm. um, here as well as I, I noticed it here, the, the panel's not on here obviously, but you can see that the mounts for it are recessed. So yeah, so there's, that on, it's there's a panel that goes over to hide the, the master cylinder so you don't see all those lines or anything like that and just cleans it up. It basically makes it look like how this is. Um, it just it makes everything match side to side. There is an out like an out dent on that side for the lines to clear on the master cylinder, uh, but it basically is the same exact shape. Cool. And then on this side you have your intercom um, mm -hmm. setup as well as the radio itself. Intercom and then your race radio. And this is something that he won from PCI as a giveaway, uh, which worked out very good. Yeah. <laughs> so now he didn't have to worry about getting all that stuff. They just hooked him up with all that. And there is space over here for a vent at some point if he ends up adding AC to the truck. 
So I did leave this open. That's why everything's kind of offset to this side, as well as it's easier for him, like reach wise, we kind of planned it out to where he could be able to get to this stuff if nobody's with him. He can still come over here and adjust whatever he needs to adjust for all this stuff. And then there's also this big stomp pad in here as well. So that's just for the passenger. They can put their feet on that and kind of press against it to hold themselves in the seat because the driver has the steering wheel to keep themselves planted. They can grab onto that thing and keep themselves planted in the seat. The passenger, if you don't have something like this and your feet are just sitting on the floor, you don't really have anything to like brace yourself with. So having a big old stomp pad like this with the dimple dies in it that are facing towards you, that just grabs the bottom of your shoe really well and it just keeps you nice and gripped up and planted in the truck. So even, even in this truck, me being 6'2", like when you're in this thing, like you can, you put your feet up against that and you're in this thing nice. Like there's plenty of room in here. Another thing that I wanna to touch on too is just with the shape of the dash, the main thing that I wanted to do is give you as much room inside of the cab as you possibly can. With this being a single cab truck, if you guys have ever sat in one of these things, especially once you start throwing a cage in them with the factory dash, you start feeling so claustrophobic in these trucks. Even when they're just bone stock, you feel very claustrophobic in these things. So with the dash, like in front of the driver and the passenger, I wanted to push it away from you as far as possible to just give you more space and just feel like you're more open inside of the truck. And that's literally exactly how it came out. So that's going to conclude this video though. We walked through a lot of the updates on the front of the truck, as well as inside the cab here. We are going to do the rear of the truck in a separate video, just because of the amount of stuff that Christian's been working on back there. So be on the lookout for that video and we'll see you in the next one. Peace.